Colin, uh, first one, you actually represent um, a human rights organization that works with and, and represents uh, the victims of human rights abuse. One of the um, sort of attractive uh, 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 guarantees and, and promises made by the ICC was that it would be very, very victim focused. It would actually go out of its way to establish um, uh, new modalities for involving victims in the, uh, the process of its, its work, its investigations and, and prosecutions. Um, one or two human rights groups have uh, you know, been somewhat critical of whether that's actually being followed through by the ICC. What, what's your own experience of the ICC in, in actually representing victims, in a, addressing their, their issues, or, or actually sort of including them within the actual procedures of, of the court? Are you, are you satisfied? I suppose as an advocate for victims' rights, I'm never satisfied. Um, but I, w I would say in relation to the statute and the rules of procedure and evidence, it was a long and quite difficult battle to uh, ensure that there were provisions that made reference to uh, victims in the architecture of the International Criminal Court. Um, what was in the minds of us as advocates and some of the delegates who uh, per partook in the, the drafting of the Rome Statute was some of the challenges that were faced, particularly in the Rwanda Tribunal, with respect to how certain uh, victim witnesses were dealt with, um, but also uh, the experience in the former Yugoslavia, etc. cetera. Um, the statute itself has a range of provisions which are new for international criminal justice in relation to victims, uh, particularly uh, the right of victims to participate not only as witnesses for the prosecution, but as uh, persons with an independent voice which may be taken into account by, by the court. Uh, additionally, the statute allows for uh, victims to be, um, to, to, to there, there's a process of reparation as well as the specialized trust funds which can provide support to, to victims in need um, as well as uh, a range of protective measures. Um, are, are we satisfied? Um, I would say that um, the provisions, it has taken quite, quite a bit of time to get provisions um, in place in a procedural framework that makes sense. Um, many of the, the lawyers, the judges um, within the International Criminal Court of course come uh, with experience from other tribunals and that experience does not include a wide understanding of how to incorporate victims within the architecture. So there, there has been a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of reticence and particularly in relation to victims who wish to participate in proceedings. Um, there has been some concern about the impact that, that's, uh, that that participation may have on the, um, the time that it would take to proceed with the, the trial. Um, in essence, I, I would suggest, however, um, that there is still much room for the court itself to develop procedures which reflect the scale of criminality and, the, and the, the range of victims and their location to make victim participation as well as reparation effective. I don't think we're there yet, though there is a slow process um, towards that. I would also say that um, s many states parties with the uh, financial crisis um, are looking at areas in the statute to cut, to limit, Etc. to uh, trying to shrink to a bare bones court. Um, in that discussion on budgets, it's often uh, areas linked to victims um, which face um, the risk of, uh, of being reduced. This is really problematic, I would say, not only for the short term of the court and, and the, the current cases that are pending, but for the long term. Involving victims in these cases in the most appropriate way is the best way to secure the success of the courts. Um, going back to some of the earlier comments uh, with respect to the over-focus on Africa, one could look at the question from a completely other side. 
um, victims in Africa are very happy that finally there is a court which is going to take a stand against impunity. It hasn't done that yet for them uh, for a variety of reasons. But in a way, it, other regions should feel jealous because actually there is this potential for uh, victims to have some justice before an international criminal jurisdiction. So there are a variety of ways to look at this problem, which I think uh, we should look at. Um, it's not states that are on trial, it's individuals who are accused of the most heinous crimes, who are walking around, many of which who are still in, in, in uh, rebel movements, armed movements, um, causing continued havoc and insecurity for victims across the region. Well, thank you very much. We are actually bumping up slightly on time. I'm, I'm always very eager to include the audience in these, these um, discussions because uh, uh, you also are a very distinguished bunch. So um, we've got approximately 15 minutes left until uh, the end of this, this session. And I'd, I'd like to invite, if, if I may, um, some questions actually to our, our panel. I'd like to get through as, as many as we can, and I'd ask if, if possible if you could identify yourself and if you have an institution, mention that as well, and uh, keep your questions as, as short and succinct as, as possible. And that particularly applies to the lawyers amongst you. <laughs> any takers? Dr. Khaled. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank very much the distinguished uh, panelists. I have a, a short comment, if I may, which uh, I'll try to bring the theoretical uh, discussions uh, down to earth. One of the reasons why my name is Khalid al-Mubarak. I am the media counselor at the Embassy of Sudan. The, uh, one of the reasons why our president was... Uh, 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 indicted by the ICC was the referral by the uh, Security Council and that happened mainly because of the American push and we have the uh, uh, declaration by John Danforth who used to be a special envoy to Sudan by uh, President Bush and he said that the declaration that therefore was genocide was actually made uh, uh, in the United States to satisfy the Christian right. So this proves what Henry Kissinger actually said to persuade the Americans not to ratify the ICC. Henry Kissinger said, this court will be politicized. It has the potential to be politicized and it can be turned against Americans. And because of that, the American Congress has passed actually a law authorizing the president to uh, use all means possible to free any American citizen being tried at uh, the ICC. So the contradiction is there. My second point, which is linked to this, is that uh, the, at the court, the uh, uh, members of the court have told the, their Spiegel magazine that once President Bashir is indicted, he will lose power. He will be overthrown by his own people. Actually, what happened, immediately after the indictment, President Bashir went to Darfur in an announced visit on television and on radio and stood on a podium and spoke for 40, 45 minutes. There were armed people around. Until he finished his speech, nothing happened to him. Uh, he was indicted in the middle of the peace process. And what happened after that is he carried on with the peace process carried on with the referendum for uh, peaceful secession of the southern Sudan, which would have been scuppered had he been uh, taken away from the political scene because of the ICC indictment. My last point is that uh, we in the Sudan do not consider the ICC as only a symptom of imbalance in law, international law, but also it is one side of a coin. The other side is there is no justice economically for Africa also. Uh, there is uh, no justice in the, in the economic treaties uh, judging the way. There is no justice between uh, 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 the European community and the African continent as far as trade <laughs> treaties are concerned and as far as the... Uh, uh, I end by saying that 
the, the very countries which insisted on the ICC have later on cooperated with President Bashir. On the 14th of July, uh, Britain and the United States helped the signature of the Darfur Peace Agreement, which is now bringing peace to Darfur. So this shows that there is a lot of contradiction and, uh, and uh, well, well, thank you for that, incompatibility. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, comment, thank you. Are there any so questions uh, as well? Uh, yes, madame. Thank you to Judge Akufo. Um, so we know that the, the African Court of Human and People's Rights haven't ex hasn't exactly been a model of efficiency. There's only been one decided case so far, two cases, but only one case has been decided on the merits. This in light of the fact that the court was already established in 2006. Now we know that courts take time to become operational, etc. But I just find it interesting that the, the criticism here is very much focused on the ICC, whereas we know that the African court hasn't exactly been very efficient. So my question to Judge Okufo is, if the court fails to really, um, well, I'm South African, so I have a real interest in this court being effective, right? But my, my question is, if this court hasn't been effective in really carrying out its core mandate, how can it be seen as effective in when that mandate is going to be extended now to, to criminal cases? And then just in favor of the, in defense of the ICC, um, one shouldn't fixate too much on the fact that only one case has been decided because there's also things such as positive complementarity, trust fund for victims, which has done remarkably good work, et cetera. Thanks. Thank you very much. We'll have a, a few more questions and now our panel will come back. Yes. Yes, sir. Right in front. Hi, it's Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Uh, Kaz Deuri here. I'm just a plain, uh, normal man on the street. Um, but I'm really interested to find out, um, because I'm not a lawyer. However, I want to find out, just going on from Dr. Firstman's point, how people in the on, the, on the streets would feel uh, that their concerns of the people who were either brutalizing them or causing crime to be committed without any uh, convictions, who decides uh, that a particular person, how, how's the mechanism for, that a particular person from, say, I'm from Kenya, say from Kenya, um, is uh, taken to the, to the Hague or, or into the ICC? How does that work? Who, who's the actual, who is it? Is it a government? Is it a law society? Is it... Uh, how does it work? I'm, I'm not really clear about that and I would like to know. Thank you. Yes, please, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lily Delilion from Real Impact. Uh, I'm here to understand, learn, and also inquire. Um, I've got a simple question. How many people need to be killed before we talk about crime against humanity or genocide. Because from our understanding, all human beings are equal. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Becca France in uh, King's College London. Um, I just have a question about um, relativity. Um, Justice Akufu, you spoke briefly about having an African court to try African criminals. Um, I was in Freetown when the Charles Taylor verdict came down, um, and it was uh, the the locals were more interested in the Champions League semi-final rather than the Charles Taylor verdict, and I, I kind of found that to be the case of, for a lot of the the verdicts that came down rather after the Samuel Hinga Norma incident. And I'm just wondering how we can improve the relativity, how we can incorporate local perspectives of justice, and if there's been any kind of action on that and where we can move forward. All right, I'd like to take one or two more questions and then the panel can return. Yes, sir. Uh, Matthew Morgan, African Business Magazine. Um, as long as the preeminent powers, America and China, uh, and Russia, 
remain outside of the International Criminal Court, also considering the massive populations they represent. So you've got a huge portion of the world's population and a huge portion of the most powerful country in the world not participating. What hope is there for you know, the IC to be really effective? And one last one. Yes. <coughs> My name is Sarah Nowen from the University of Cambridge. I'm an international lawyer. Um, I'm the first to, uh, or not the first, but I'm one of the many to argue that the International Criminal Court has many political dimensions, and I do not want to deny that, and it's a fascinating debate. But I do think that when we discuss the international law, we need to be ex extremely specific. And in that regard, I've got two questions for Professor Kochler. One is, um, what's the problem with the referral issue in the sense of the jurisdiction over crimes, because Article 21 of the statute clearly says that the applicable law of the court is first and foremost the statute. So the court cannot exercise jurisdiction over crimes outside its statute, even if the Security Council says so. The, the court is more bound by its statute than by Security Council resolutions. In other words, the Security Council resolution cannot do anything uh, effectively if that is not in the statute of the court. Um, secondly, since when is Article 34 of the VCLT use Kogans? I mean, what is the legal source for that statement? It's quite difficult to find use Kogans and establish use Kogans in international law. And we've seen it perhaps with genocide torture, but a, a rule that um, treaties do not bind third states. Um, I don't think I've, that I've ever seen any authority for the claim that it is use Kogans. Moreover, it's not really relevant. In, to, the, in the, to the extent that the Security Council has established or given jurisdiction to other courts in the world, and therefore it is not unimaginable that it can give jurisdiction to an existing court. Theoretically, it could even give jurisdiction to, for instance, an English court, uh, at least as long as we, as long as we accept the ICTY's um, establishment. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have um, sort of maybe so 10 minutes for responses. If I could, I mean, by all means, actually answer any of these questions or, or if you have any more comments, um, uh, I'll also voice them. If you can actually go back in, in reverse order. So, uh, Dr. Firstman. Thank you. I'll, I'll just um, say quickly on who decides that a particular person goes to The Hague. Um, the Security Council can refer a situation to the courts. Um, the uh, states' parties can also refer situations like actual uh, crimes in a particular region or a country, etc. Um, individuals can communicate with the office of the prosecutor, but the prosecutor itself, the office of the prosecutor, is the one that actually determines whether there are any particular <coughs> crimes against any particular individuals which should be uh, brought forward. Then it goes to the pretrial chamber to confirm whether or not there is sufficient evidence to proceed uh, with the issuance of an arrest warrant. So it's a bit of a complicated process, but the prosecutor is really essential in that to get a case from a broad understanding of a particular conflict, narrowing it down to particular individuals. Um, just uh, uh, comments with respect to crimes against humanity, how many individuals. The law is uh, that um, any uh, crime against humanity must be widespread and systematic. Um, I don't think there's any uh, judgment or, or uh, issue where, where, where that has been turned into um, 10 or, or 50 or 100. It's more the, co it's the context of the crime which, um, which determines whether it can be said that a particular crime is widespread and systematic, which is the requirement for crimes against humanity. Thank you. And uh, uh, Professor Chan? I think that the questions asked are really, really good questions. And I'm going to avoid uh, some of the more technical ones, but certainly in terms of some of the more politically based questions. Yes, I agree that there's been a lot of political motivation behind uh, efforts to involve the ICC and other tribunals uh, in the affairs of Africa and other parts of the world. And in the case of Sudan, uh, I think that the approach the Chinese took, uh, particularly the role of the special envoy, uh, Li Guiyin, in terms of his face-to-face -face discussions with different groups uh, in Sudan, in Darfur, in Khartoum and elsewhere, in the end was far more beneficial to leading to some kind of uh, way forward in terms of bringing some form of peace to that part of Sudan. 
so that the effort to indict President Bashir in this particular case was not, I think, helpful. And this is not necessarily to say that crimes against humanity were not committed in Darfur, but insofar as the court might be used as a political instrument, then I think that its political results were not helpful at that point in time. Uh, but that very, very much, I think, reinforces the point that I made earlier in my presentation, that insofar as you have an admixture of politics and justice, it's got to be extremely carefully done in terms of trying to use instruments and architectures that are meant to prosecute justice for political reasons. The minute you've introduced overt political maneuvers, overt political reasons and justifications into this, then I think you are calling into question the whole efficacy of institutions that are meant to be designed to serve justice. Yeah, just to follow up on Stephen's points about the politics of the ICC, I think I really want to stress two points about why it's problematic for all of us. It's problematic for all of us because of the assumptions behind it about how states and societies operate. And the first point is the one about international norms. We sort of argue as if the most basic international norm we could have is the end of mass human rights abuses, genocide, war, conflict. Now that sounds like a really great starting point. However, the world does not work like that. Even in developed Western liberal stable societies, bringing law into a conflict situation where there's no consensus is clearly political and problematic. Now the idea, this is what I meant about the distance, the idea that, yeah, that's the first norm we should bring into conflict in Africa, laws that are impossible for any society to normalise in a conflict situation. How does that make our understanding of Africa and the spreading of international norms look? And people in the audience have already intimated there's a lot of other norms that you could bring in. They'd be a lot easier to think about institutionalising and how we might operate. Why pick this particular most problematic, most impossible way of understanding Africa? It's, um, you know, it sounds good, but it isn't. And the second really, really problematic understanding is this idea that war and ordinary life aren't different at all. This idea of making individuals accountable, making torturers accountable, individual, individual human beings, soldiers or not, caught up in a conflict or a war. Yeah, we're going to make them accountable, like they're ethical individuals walking down the high street here in central London. Uh, sounds like it's very nice, but actually you're taking all the politics, all the social relations, all the context out of that question. It's essentially a neoliberal understanding of individuals choosing to be unethical or criminal as if we were in a domestic context of Camden or somewhere. And I sort of think we need a big division between what we feel nice about and sounds good and, and the real world, particularly when it's someone else's world. We're not even... Um, you know, living there or responsible or accountable in any way. And that's often the problem with a slightly abstract academic or legal argument. And the ICC, I think, brings out the worst in terms of those things. And Professor Kukler? Concerning all those things, yeah, I agree with you. We have to be specific. And uh, the main point is, you would be right if it indeed would be so that the Security Council is a law unto itself, or that the Security Council is above the law. John Foster Dulles once said, made that famous statement that we have to accept that the Council is a law unto itself. Uh, and concerning your specific questions, the Security Council does not possess a right to create tribunals, to create courts of law. That is not in conformity with uh, some of the mo one of the most basic principles of international law, namely that every person has a right to be tried before a court of law that is duly, a court that is duly established by law. Creation by executive fiat, by an, uh, the, even if it's the supreme executive body of the United Nations, is not creation uh, by law. Only if a court is created by international <laughs> treaty that will have to be ratified by the legislative authority in each and every of the uh, member states is that requirement fulfilled. By the way, that's not just my point. That is a point that has been very precisely made by the Chinese judge 
in the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And there is no time now to go into the details. I've just published uh, an essay on the Security Council as Administrator of Justice with a big question mark, where I list all those details. As far as Jus Kogens is concerned, that beautiful Latin term, certainly there is a wide disagreement among scholars of law on the continent, for instance, there are many since the 70s who have said that basic principles of human rights, for instance, are part of the Jus Kogens, now, for instance, people in Switzerland lawyers tell us, no, that's not so, because the Swiss people has just decided to ban minarets, so the right to religious freedom is certainly not part of Jus Kogens, because otherwise Switzerland would have a, a real issue as a state and as a, a violator of, uh, of a basic human rights principle, uh, basic principle of Jus Kogens. But uh, as far as the Vienna Convention of the law of, on the law of the treaties is concerned, I go along with... Uh, uh, Hans Kelsen's view that pacta, the maxim pacta sunt servanda is the very, very basic principles of the international legal order as such. It's, so to speak, the constitutive principle. And the other side of the coin, so to speak, of course, is that what is written down in Article 34, that no state is bound by a treaty which it has not signed, or no state has rights under a treaty, which, is not a, which he is not a party to. And as if we accept, which I would say, that the Security Council is not above the law, the Security Council is not a godlike institution that has the right even to invalidate the most basic condition of the possibility of uh, international law, as long as this is the case, I will not accept uh, that the Security Council has a right to create jurisdiction or f where it doesn't exist. And by the way, if you go, because you spoke about the details, and I should not speak any longer, but because it could get very long if we get specific, and we have to get technical, otherwise the matter is not serious. You are right. But in the, in the Rome Statute, we have no time to read it. I have it here. In the, in the Rome Statute, uh, as far as the referrals are concerned, or the triggering of jurisdiction, in the case, there are these three points, A, B, C, by states parties, and there it is added within the jurisdiction of the court. And by the prosecutor, again, reference is made to, the uh, to crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. In the formulation about the referrals, there is no such... Uh, addendum, and if you go to the preceding Article 11, you will also see that this item B, 13B, is completely left out. And there is a meaning to it, and I know there was a debate, some people would have, have already said, yeah, the Security Council has the referral right, but only if uh, there is a jurisdiction on the basis of territoriality or nationality. But the official reading, so to speak, uh, among the states parties of the court and among the United Nations membership is that uh, the Security Council can effectively create jurisdiction. That, that's why I say, ironically, the, uh, the International Criminal Court, which is, by the way, not in any way an agent of universal jurisdiction. It only uh, um, exercises uh, jurisdiction on the basis of complementarity, but it gets a kind of borrowed universal jurisdiction from the International Criminal Court and I, from, the, from the Security Council. And I would also say this provision, 13b and also 16 in a certain sense, makes the International Criminal Court an ad hoc court for purposes of the Security Council in the cases which we have seen namely, uh, so far, Sudan and Libya. Well, thank you very much for that. Lady Justice Akufu. Um, thank you. I think I'll go directly to the questions relating to the African court. And uh, starting with the first one concerning the effectiveness of the, of the court. Um, first, I have to uh, quickly point out that vis-a-vis um, -vis the ICC, at the moment, the existing, the currently operational African court will not even be able to substitute for, 
for, for the ICC. That was not the point that I, I sought to make because at the moment, firstly, the, 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 uh, the African Court of Human and People's Justice that is currently operational can only uh, receive cases against states rather than against individuals. Secondly, um, we do not even have criminal jurisdiction. The criminal jurisdiction has been um, uh, added, it's, one, it's part of it's, uh, the new, you know, the, the, the innovation that is being made in the, in the uh, continental regime. And uh, it's expected that at the next AU summit, that will be finalized and added to what is called the merged court, which will be handling uh, general law, human rights, and criminal matters. So at the moment, we handle only human rights cases. Uh, the other point is that, um, as most of you are aware, the, the, there is a clawback clause in the protocol establishing the court, which, which, um, which uh, claws back the scope of, the, of access by individuals and NGOs. And uh, one is not likely to have one state bringing another state to before us for human rights violations. And, uh, and because of that, there, have been, there, there has been a limit to who comes there. there. At the moment, there are only five countries. Unfortunately, South Africa is not one of those countries that have actually made declarations accepting the jurisdiction of the court to take cases from individuals. Um, as at now, as at the end of last year, we had about uh, 12 cases, and as at now, we ha we've had nine applications. Not all of them we've even seen because they are being dealt with administratively at the moment. But um, as a result, most of the applications that we get are coming from countries that have not made the declarations, and therefore uh, we end up declining jurisdiction. But, but interestingly, um, in the second hearing that we have had, in the second public hearing we've had as a court, we did hear a case by a Nigerian national against the African Union itself challenging the legality or, or the power of the African Union to enact that clawback clause. So or rather ch challenging the validity and legality of that clawback clause. We haven't uh, d d delivered a judgment, so I mean, I that's about all that I can say about that. Uh, thirdly, the court is, the judges are not full-time judges. We meet uh, two weeks in every three months, and uh, most of us have our regular day jobs, I'm on the Supreme Court of Ghana. Most of the others are either judges or jurists who have other things to do. It's only the president who is, is, is permanent. So we try to pack in as much work as possible and in between sessions we consult so that we could speed up the completion of our cases. And, um, and actually it's not just two cases that we have completed. We have, uh, I was just doing a quick count and we have completed at least nine cases, but most of them were completed in chambers because they simply dealt with the question of whether um, the, with the uh, admissibility question is the country that is being brought before the court one that has made the declaration. But we do have quite a number of cases now uh, from Malawi, which has made the, the, the declaration, from Tanzania, which has made the declaration. And, uh, and these are cases that are under consideration. Thank well, you. thank you uh, very much indeed. I always know it's very dangerous to come uh, between an audience and it's, it's coffee uh, and cigarette break. So um, it's been a, a very interesting session. I think our, our speakers and, and the audience have actually uh, sort of put their fingers on a, a number of, of issues. Um, and I think if the, the conference continues in this, this way, it will be a, a very interesting forum indeed. So um, without further ado, a thank you to our, 
our, our speakers um, on the panel and thank you also to the audience.